Wales, one of the four countries of the United Kingdom, has a fascinating and often overlooked history. My aim here is to tell you the story of Wales, starting today with a very unusual subject. You would expect most of the kings in Wales to be Welsh, or perhaps Brythonic, depending on when you're talking about, but it's unlikely that you'd expect them to be Irish. Today I'm going to be discussing the complete history of the Kingdom of Dubed, from Celtic tribes to the fall of Rome, from colonisation across the sea to a history wrapped up in myth and legend. This is the complete history of the Irish Kingdom of Wales. Dubed takes its name from the Iron Age tribe that lived here, the Demeter. They characteristically lived in large clusters of small hill forts, typically only containing about six round huts. This, along with a lack of many larger hill forts, suggests that the Demeter were very decentralised and organised within family groups. The area of the Demeter is also the origin of one of the most famous monuments in Britain, Stonehenge. The stones in Stonehenge are generally considered to have originated in the Priscelli Mountains of Pembrokeshire, although how they got to southern England remains a mystery. John Davis suggests that if they were quarried and carried, then this mountain may have been chosen due to some kind of religious significance. Although all of Wales was a remote frontier in these times, the Demeter were particularly disconnected. They were one of the last areas of Wales to be conquered by the Romans, and this invading empire does not even mention them. Pliny's Natural History names this area as the territory of the Silures, and it's not until Ptolemy that these Britons are finally acknowledged. By around 150 AD, the Romans seem to have given the Demeter a degree of autonomy, similar to their neighbour to the east. Can we have self-government? No. These were called Civitas, and the Demeter's capital was likely located at Moradunum, modern-day Carmarthen. Despite the lack of Roman forts in Pembrokeshire, this area was likely fairly pacified if not Romanized. We could safely say this due to the presence of Roman villas in the area, whose farms relied both on the economy brought by a garrisoning legion, and on the confidence that they wouldn't be burnt down or destroyed. It is in these farms that we can find what is now one of the symbols of Wales, the leek, a plant that originally came from the Middle East. I wonder, if the Romans never invaded, what would our national symbol be instead? Perhaps something more common in this time? Like cholera. Unfortunately, or fortunately depending on who you ask, Roman rule would soon start to fall apart. Roman Britain had a proportionally large garrison, and ambitious Roman generals like Magnus Maximus and Constantinus would utilise this vast pool of troops in their effort to become emperors of Rome. As the legions left, the economy and security of these lands would start to decrease. The villas were abandoned, and grain started to be dried inside the city walls. And soon it was apparent that assistance from Rome was never going to arrive. Many Iron Age hill forts, such as Coigan Camp in Doved, were reoccupied following the Roman withdrawal, and a picture of small regional kingdoms centred on ancient defensive sites starts to be painted. In fact, John Davis suggests that these local kingdoms may be the foundation for the Cantrevi, the administrative divisions of medieval Wales. Charles Edwards suggests that we view the immediate post-Roman period in Wales as one of conflict between the urban civitas and the rural warlords. And if we view the fate of Moradonum in this way, then they seem to have been reasonably successful. They probably lost control of this region, known as Ceredigion, as we have records of independent kings here likely going back to the Roman withdrawal. They also seem to have lost all the lands to their east, namely Ostrad Toei, Kidweli, and Gwyr. We can deduce this from some admittedly contentious evidence, and you may disagree with this conclusion. But the historian Charles Edwards supports a theory that the reason many Comotes and Kentrevi contain either upper or lower in their name is not to do with geography, but in fact related to their distance from a royal capital. So lower Comotes are closer, and upper Comotes are further and the cantrev that Moradana would find itself in was called Cantrev Gwarthav, the uppermost cantrev, indicating that this land had at some point become a frontier, and the furthest boundary of a local kingdom. So combining this theory with John Davis's, we can draw a picture of this chaotic period. After the Romans left, it seems that many of the civitas in Britain would struggle to maintain control against local warlords who operated out of these ancient Iron Age forts. The Civitas of the Demeter would lose control of all land to its east, perhaps to warlords whose kingdoms would mark the boundaries of the future Kentrevi, but it would retain control of the west. This land would come to be known in Latin as Demetia, named after the Demeter. Although this was quite common in the post-Roman world, in Wales this is very unique, as most people would derive their name from their kingdom, not the other way around. And now the dust has settled, except for one thing. 
I said that the Civitas, Moradunum, was now at the furthest boundary away from the capital. When, and to who, did this government lose control of its territory? To answer that, we have to look across the ocean, which means it's Ireland time. By the time of the Roman withdrawal, Irish raids along the coast of Wales had been happening for around 50 years, and they would continue into the late 5th century. Not all of these Irish were raiders, many of them were migrants who settled across Britain, but particularly in Anglesey and Dovid. Despite not being conquered by Rome, they still decided to follow some Roman traditions, such as planting corpse identifiers, also known as memorial stones, which are frequently marked in the ancient Irish alphabet of Ogham, and most of these stones are located in Dovid. These are largely concentrated around the Preseli Mountains and the southern side of the Tavy, indicating quite a substantial level of Irish migration. Despite this influx, Charles Edward suspects that the Irish did not yet usurp control from Moradunum, as, like I said before, the Civitas seems to have maintained control over this area, which contained a new, distinct Irish identity in Wales that would last for at least two centuries before becoming assimilated into the local Brythonic culture. Although numerous Irish raids and migrations occurred over the century, we are interested in one in particular, and we can find this in the 8th century Irish poem, The Expulsion of the Daishi. This poem tells the tale of a tribe from Meath, who were harassed by the High King of Ireland and forced to migrate to Leinster, and then eventually Munster. This story, which involves a drunk prophet who has the ability to turn people into cows, is probably not real, and it was likely constructed to provide an explanation as to why there were multiple tribes in Ireland known as the Daishi. However, one portion of the tale certainly holds some truth. We are told, and I'm going to try my best with the pronunciations, that a man named Eughydd Almuir migrated into Leinster across the Irish Sea and into Dovid, and that his ancestors continued to live in the area. We're given a list of his descendants, and they are very interesting because from his great-grandson onwards, they line up exactly with the pedigree of the kings in Dovid found in the Harleian genealogies. So from this information, we can theorise that this group of Irish, the Daishi, migrated into Dovid and somehow managed to usurp control of the kingdom, imposing themselves as the kings of Demetia, or Demed in Irish, which probably happened by the start of the 6th century at the latest. As I said, the later Harleian genealogies have quite a few discrepancies when compared to the pedigree found in the expulsion of the Daishi. However, historians seem to vastly favour this claim to Irish ancestry. The Harleian genealogies contain most of the Irish names, but instead of tracing their ancestry back to Eochid, they instead claim to be of Roman descent, specifically from Magnus Maximus, a theme that was very common in this document. John Davis suggests that perhaps Magnus Maximus invited the Daishi into Dovid so that they could defend the land from further raids, but the historian Carrie Mound attributes this supposed Roman ancestry to a simple desire for legitimacy. These later genealogies are valuable, but not reliable. They are vulnerable to, and likely already were, subject to rewriting, in order to claim authority. The existence of these Irish names in both documents, along with the evidence we have of a fairly substantial Irish migration, have led historians to say with near certainty that sometime between the 5th and 6th centuries, the Civitas of the Demeter were usurped, and the Kingdom of Dovid would go on to be ruled by an Irish dynasty. We're unsure when exactly this happened. The Life of St. Samson refers to the existence of the Kingdom of Dovid sometime in the 6th century, and legal documents in the Slandaf Charters describe the existence of several royal sites dating back to this era, such as at Tenby, Slanion, Lareni, and Moncton. Eochid's son, Korath, and his son, Eid Brosk, are only mentioned in the Daishi genealogy, but Eid's son, Trestin, is referred to as a king in the Life of St. David, where we are told that Gildas used to preach in a church in Dovid during the reign of King Trifinus. So, as you might be able to see, Trestin had more than one name. In Welsh, he would be called Trifin, and in Latin, Tribunus. Not only does this show the interesting fact that some Welsh kings took Roman titles as personal names, possibly giving weight to Davis's hypothesis that the Daishi were placed here on purpose, but also shows an unusual and fairly unique attribute of the early Kingdom of Dovid. It was a trilingual state, with kings bearing Irish, Welsh, and Latin names, and the inscribed stones of this period are marked in all three languages as well. So as we see, after a murky period of confusion, it seems that by the 6th century, an Irish kingdom centred around the rich agricultural lands of Pembrokeshire had been created. The Roman Civitas centred at Moradunum was no longer in control, and had now become the furthest frontier from these royal centres to the west. Trestin's descendants are agreed upon by both the Daishi and the Harleian pedigrees, and his son, Ergol Lauhir, presumably had inherited the throne sometime around the start of the 6th century. Ergol, or Alcol in Irish, was derived from the Latin name Agricola, and we are told that he apparently held his court at Lis Castes, near Tenby. 
This Llys was apparently cursed, and the Book of Llandaf tells us that every night, someone in the royal court would mysteriously die. Ergol summoned Saint Talio to bless the palace, and as a reward for stopping the killings, he granted the saint an extensive tract of land in northern Pembrokeshire. One source we have for this era is the 7th century Life of Saint Samson that I mentioned earlier. Here we are told that Samson's father was a member of the aristocracy of David, and that his mother was from the neighbouring kingdom of Gwent. Even though, as we've already seen, the Civitas at Moradonum seems to have lost control of all the lands to its east, so it appears that at least by the 6th century, David had reconquered this territory. Charles Edwards names the most likely boundary between David and Gwent as the River Neath, which was defended on the David side by the 6th century stronghold of Hen Gastes. So for David and Gwent to have shared a border in the 6th century, we can theorise that around the early 500s, the Kingdom of David successfully conquered Ustred Toei, Kidwelly, and Gwyr, restoring most of the old boundaries of the Roman Civitas and pushing its border right up to the River Neath, making them a neighbour of Gwent. This could have happened during the reign of Ergol, with his epithet of Long Hand possibly referring to his wide-reaching conquests. Additionally, the life of St. Samson refers to the beginnings of a royal bureaucracy in Dovet, with Samson's ancestors apparently being Ministry Tereni Regni, who likely served as tax collectors, according to the historian Wendy Davis. Perhaps these offices were necessary after Ergol enlarged his kingdom, or maybe this degree of centralization allowed David to militarily outcompete the small, localized chiefdoms that may have dominated post Roman Carmarthenshire. Despite Ergol's military successes, he would, according to Taliesin, be defeated by Cunan Garwin, king of Powys, in a battle at Krieg David, and Ergol would be forced to flee. This defeat doesn't appear to have resulted in any sort of conquest, as Ergol seems to have returned at some point as he was apparently buried in David. Gildas, in his angry sermon, would refer to Ergol indirectly, as he calls his descendant the bad son of a good king, and this descendant would be the Irish king Vortipur. As I said, this king of David is one of the five kings Gildas criticises in his sermon De Excudio et Conquestu Britannia, on the ruin and conquest of Britain. Along with Vortipur, Gildas also lambasts the dubious figures of Constantine of Domnonia, Aurelius Canonus, Cunaglassus, and Malgonconus. Out of all of these, Vortipur is probably the most unambiguous, for reasons we'll see in a minute. Constantine can be located pretty easily, I mean, it's right there, and Malgonconus is probably Malgun Gwynedd. Cunaglassus might be Cunlas Goch, king of Ross, and Aurelius Canonus is apparently some sort of wordplay on the name of Cunan, likely Cunan Garwin of Powys. The manner of which Gildas refers to Vortiper as the bad son of a good king indicates that he was at least the second king of David, although with the evidence we've already seen, he was probably the third. Gildas calls Vortiper a leopard, diverse in manners and mischief, and he describes him as a foolish tyrant who is stained with murder, violence, and adultery. Gildas, a devout Christian, seems to be almost baffled that this king, even while he's approaching the end of his life, still commits these violent acts of sin. Outside of Gildas's criticism, scarcely more is mentioned about Vortiper, although a poem in the Umdudian does mention that the men of David fought against an invading army of Gwynedd, led by Malgun, which probably occurred during Vortiper's reign. Like his father and grandfather, this king of a trilingual kingdom also possessed an Irish and Latin name. In Welsh, he's called Gwortiper, or Gwythavir, becoming Vortiper in most modern day writings, but his name seems to have been Latin in origin, and it was written as Vortiperigus on his memorial stone. This standing stone was discovered in 1895 at Castell Duiran in Carmarthenshire. Its Latin inscription simply reads Memoria Vortiperigus Protectoris. But next to these etchings is a commemoration of Vortiper's Irish name, written in the ancient Ogham alphabet, Vortecorigas. His title, Protectoris, is very interesting. Originally, this title was given to the bodyguards of the Roman Emperor, but during the later years of the Empire, it seems to have become an honorary title given to barbarian rulers who would serve as protectors of the Roman frontier, and examples of this can be found in Toulouse, Ostrogothic Italy, and with the kings of Burgundy. This title had also likely become hereditary, which we can see both here in David but also in the Kingdom of Burgundy. This title is unique in Wales and perhaps does indicate that these Daishi kings were invited to David by a Roman emperor in order to defend it from further Irish incursions, although whether this link is legitimate or just simply a claim to being descended from a higher authority is debated. Vortiper probably died sometime around the mid-6th century, and his successes would be significantly more historically obscure. Charles Edwards estimates that it was roughly sometime around this century that the Irish culture in Dovid would become assimilated into the local Brythonic one. 
Although all of these kings possess Irish names, it is unknown how Irish they themselves felt or claimed to be. Vortipur's son, Cungar, would succeed him, and he would be followed by his son, Pedder, who would be followed by his son, Arthur. Huh, Arthur, that's an interesting name. I wonder if it will have any sort of historical significance in the future. Joking aside, this Arthur ap Petter, or Artwir Macrathor in Irish, is likely named after the famous King Arthur, although this does open a book titled When, and Who, and How, and What was Arthur, which I'm not going to open today. His son, Noe, became king at some point, although he, like many of his ancestors, goes completely unmentioned in the contemporary sources. And finally, for this unknown section of the pedigree, we have Gulivien. Unlike many of the kings of this era, we actually know something about him. His wife, Cain Duech, was the daughter of Ruathlon, the king of Brycheiniog. We know this because of two royal pedigrees, the Harleian genealogy and the Jesus College pedigree. The Harleian genealogies of David state that Gulithian was succeeded by his son, Cathen, but the Jesus College pedigrees of Brycheiniog also state that their king Ruathlon was succeeded by a man named Cathen, and they make him the son of Cain Duech, the daughter of the king. As we can see here, the pedigree of the kings of Brycheiniog from this point seem to share exactly three names with a list of the kings of David. So from this evidence, we can theorize that the kingdom of Brycheiniog came under the control of David sometime during the 7th century. Ruathlon of Brycheiniog may not have had a male heir, giving an opportunity for his daughter's husband to march in and take control of the kingdom. If you thought that the evidence for David's previous expansion was too contentious, then the annexation of Rechaniog proves that this kingdom very likely controlled at least the Toei Valley by this time. This is further proven by Cathen's son, Cadugon, who again is listed as both the king of David and Rechaniog. In the life of St. Odysseus, Cadugon is said to control the lands west of the Toei, and he apparently would harass the monasteries of Odysseus in Slandelio Vaur and Slandavuwu in Ustrad Toei. His son, Rhein, is the last king from David to be listed in the pedigree of Brycheiniog, for reasons that we'll get to soon. But by this time, the kings of David may have been ruling Brycheiniog for close to a century. However, the historian P.C. Bartram describes this realm as unwieldy, and it was during the kingship of Rhein ap Cadugon that the kingdom of Ceredigion, formed from the lands north of David that the Civitas at Moradonum lost over 300 years ago, decided to invade. I went into detail on the evidence we have for this invasion in my video on the Kingdom of Ceredigion, so I'd recommend watching that one after this. But to summarise, in the Welsh laws we can find references to two previously unmentioned polities, Saesaslug and Reynug. Now, on the surface, this doesn't mean much, but in the Mabinogion, the name of Saesaslug appears again, and we are told that it is made up of the three Cantrevi of Ustratoi and the four Cantrevi of Ceredigion. Of course, the Mabinogion is not a history book, but the existence of this name in the Welsh laws indicates that something resembling it must have existed at some point. Additionally, the names of these kingdoms match the names of the kings of Ceredigion and Dovid at this time, Sisis and Rhein. Furthermore, as we'll soon see, the kingdom of Rhaenyog would break away from Dovid, an event that no doubt was greatly helped by its sudden separation from the core of the kingdom. Historians are in disagreement as to how permanent this conquest might have been, with John Davis seeming to support the idea that David never recovered this loss of land, Carrie Mound suggesting that it may have reclaimed Ustrad Toei, and Charles Edwards putting forward the idea that David almost certainly retook Ustrad Toei, and even conquered Ceredigion, but we'll cover all of these later. For now, it appears that King Saisis of Ceredigion conquered the Toei Valley from King Rhein of David, sometime between 730 and 750 AD. This left Rain with the old core of his kingdom, matching the now ancient boundaries that the Civitas held after the fall of Rome. As I said before, later Welsh chroniclers would occasionally call this shrunken realm Rainug, possibly named after this king Rain. However, Bartram disagrees on the certainty that this realm was meant to be in Dovid, as we have a few documents placing it somewhere else. He suggests that this instead may have referred to the united lands of Dovid and Brycheiniog, or that it referred to only Brycheiniog and was named after their king Rain Dremrith. Walter Mapp, a 12th century writer and courtier to Henry II, seems to have supported this by describing an area in Wales known as Brachan's Land of Reynos. However, Humphrey Sloward, the 16th century Welsh cartographer that created the Cambria Typus, described the region of Herefordshire beyond the Wye as being called Reynuk in Welsh, and you can see this on his map. Reynuk, just south of Hereford, and distinctly not in Brycheiniog. Unfortunately, we do not know which one of these interpretations are correct. All we can say with any certainty is that King Rain now commanded a much smaller realm, and that Brycheiniog, now disconnected and far out of reach, soon began to vie for its independence. We can deduce that Rain ap Cadogon died sometime before the year 750. 
according to the Harleian genealogies, his now split kingdom was divided between his two sons, with Tudor succeeding him in Dovet, and, according to the Jesus College pedigrees, his other son, Tudor, succeeded him in Rechenog. Huh, Tudor, that's an interesting name. I wonder if it will have any sort of historical significance in the future. As you might have guessed, the local nobility in Brecheniog seemed to have taken advantage of their conquerors suddenly being completely out of reach, and a rival to King Tudor, Elustil ab Aust, emerged at this time. In the Book of Slandaf, we can find a peace treaty between these two monarchs, where both men swore on the altar of St. Apricius to stop their fighting. However, Tudor apparently broke this oath and killed Elustil, claiming the entire kingdom of Brecheniog once again. For now, this kingdom would retain a separate but still blood-related dynasty from David, and this new line of Tudor would maintain its independence for around 200 years. Wendy Davis dates this peace treaty to the year 750, hence why we can estimate that Rain had died by this time, and that his sons began to rule in his place. Meanwhile, Tudor rules David, and he is the last king recorded in the expulsion of the Daishi, providing us with a rough estimate as to when this tale was written. Up until this point, you may have noticed that Dovet has been severely lacking in one enemy, England. The first attack by a Saxon monarch into Dovet occurred in 778, when King Offa of Mercia led a raid into southern Wales. Unlike the attack of Offa's successors in the north, this did not lead to any sort of conquest, although it did signal the start of a very tumultuous period in Dovet. Tudis's son, Meredith, was most likely king by the time of Offa's invasion, and he was particularly interesting due to the fact that his sons have their own chapter in the Harleian genealogies. As you can see here, Rain, Idon, and Owain are recorded as the three sons of Meredith, and due to the fact that Meredith and his son Rain are explicitly referenced as the kings of Dovid in the Annals Cambria, we can confidently say that this chapter is about Meredith ap Tudis. His death brings us this reference, as Meredith Rex Demetorum, the king of Dovid, is recorded as dying in the year 796. His death, while not seeming of any major importance, would signal the start of an extremely tumultuous period in Dovid. And over the next 18 years, this kingdom would lose a further three monarchs. Up until this point, we've been shown a picture of relatively straightforward succession, with each king being followed by his son. However, with the absence of the finer details of this period, we cannot safely assume that it was always so straightforward. Although I will say something that I think anyone who is interested in this period should keep in mind. We know much more than you might think. Claimants to the throne from outside of the royal dynasties have been recorded as far back as the 7th century, and conquest by rival dynasties can often be interpreted from simple pedigree evidence, such as two kings from the pedigree of Ross suddenly showing up as the monarchs of Gwynedd, or the three shared kings of Dovid and Brecheniog. I'm not saying that this period was very well documented, but what I am saying is that historians are not just simply guessing blindly. Having said all that, this chapter of the Harleian genealogies seems to give us this wider context that we so often lack. Chapter 2, The Pedigree of Dovid, tells us that Meredith was succeeded by his son Owain. However, with this expanded list of sons found in chapter 14, along with the other expanded ancestry of an apparent son of Rain found in chapter 13, we can paint a much more complicated picture. Idon ap Meredith is not mentioned outside of this pedigree, so he can be safely ignored like every middle sibling. Rain, the eldest son, seems to have been ruler of Dovid after his father's death, but this would only last 12 years, as in 808 AD, Rain, Rex Demetorum, has his death recorded in the Annals Cambria. Rather than going to Rain's son, the one who was recorded in chapter 13, the throne seems to have been passed to the youngest of Meredith's lineage, Owain, who had ruled for an even grander length of three years. Owain's death, like his father and his siblings, is recorded in the Welsh Annals. However, unlike his father and his brother, Owain is not recorded as the King of David. His entry simply calls him Son of Meredith. Now, this might have some sort of significance in such a tumultuous time. Perhaps we could theorise that David was conquered or overpowered, However, we can be confident of this kingdom's existence at least in the latter half of this century. And none of the future kings are recorded as Rex Demetorum either, meaning that this could just as easily be a simple scribal error. Regardless, the Harleian genealogies do not record Owain as having any sons, only one daughter who will become important later. Which means that the throne appears to have fallen to the last direct male descendant of the Daishi in Dovid, a man fittingly named Triffin, and he too would have a short reign of only three years dying in 814, a year apparently marked by a great thunderstorm. A dramatic end to such a chaotic period. Triffin, Trestin or Tribunus was the first recorded king of the line of the Daishi, and Triffin ap Rain was the last. Although this was not the end of the Kingdom of David, I think it is worth briefly summarising here. 
After usurping control of Dubbard from the Roman Civitas at Moradunum sometime in the early 6th century, these Irish kings, directly descended from the Daishi tribe, would rule Dubbard for the next 300 years. They reconquered Ushra Toei, Kidweli, and Goer, and annexed the Kingdom of Rheiniog for about a century, until sometime around 730 to 750 AD, when their neighbour, Ceredigion, would cut their kingdom in half, leaving Dubbard once again restricted to the west. A century later, a chaotic period would begin, marked by the start of Saxon raids into Dubbard, and culminating with the death of four monarchs in 18 years, which would bring an end to this ancient line. We can only theorise as to why there were so many monarchal deaths in the early 9th century. This problem was not unique to Dubbard, as the old dynasties of Gwynedd and Powys would also come to an end at this time, and English raids against these two kingdoms would soon begin to ramp up. Powys is recorded as being overwhelmed by Cynwulf of Mercia in 822, following his successful annexation of Rivoniog in Gwynedd, and Dubbard may have been subjected to many more attacks than just the one recorded by Offa in 778. Whether these four kings of Dubbard died fighting for their independence against a Saxon threat, or in some sort of local or civil conflict, we may never know. From 814 onwards, we are left with a period of mystery instead of chaos, as the next king of Dubbard, Havaith ap Bledri, who died in 893, can't have become king much earlier than about 840, leaving a substantial time gap between the start of his reign and the end of Triffin's. So what might have happened in this period? The Harlane genealogies tell us the ancestry of Havaith. They name him as the son of Tangwistil, that daughter of King Owain that I mentioned earlier. Although Owain's daughter is included in the royal pedigree, it is unlikely that she ruled as queen, as a society that prevented women from inheriting land or titles is unlikely to have made an exception for the crown. Luckily for us, we know the name of Tangwistil's husband, as the Welsh chronicle Brut Etoesogion records her son as Havaith, son of Bledri. Bledry's origins are completely unknown. In fact, one of the Welsh triads refer to Havaith as one of the three kings sprung from villains, a dubious accolade given only to three men, who all became king without being directly connected to the male line. His full name in this triad is Havaith ap Bleithig, a name which despite looking like a simple spelling mistake, actually occurs in one other place. A poem in the Book of Taliesin refers to a Bleithig, naming him as the Lord of Dinbich, as we've seen towards the start of this video, Dinbich or Tenby was one of the royal courts of Dubbard, and Charles Edwards puts forward the theory that this Bleithid was likely Bleithig, who in turn seems to have been Bledri, the father of Havaith, the future king of Dubbard. If Bledri is referred to as a lord of a royal court in Dubbard, then is it possible that he ruled this kingdom for a time? Perhaps he claimed inheritance through his wife, or was at least in a powerful enough position to be able to seize power following the tumultuous early 9th century. If this was the case, then it was likely during Bledry's reign when Cunwulf of Mercia led a devastating attack against Dubbard, following his successful annexation of Eastern Gwynedd. Although Cunwulf was remarkably successful in Wales, following the attack in 818, Dubbard would not have to face another English army for nearly 80 years. Bledry died at some point, and his son Havaith became king by at least 874, as the monks of St. David record that this king expelled the Archbishop Nobis, whose last year of service was in 874. Although Havaith would not have to face the furious Mercian armies anytime soon, he would instead be plagued by two new foes, a resurgent Gwynedd in the north, and some angry Scandinavians in the west. Vikings. Vikings first arrived in Anglesey in 877, and in 878 they would land in Dubbard. The Welsh monk Asser tells us that this armada, which was probably from Dublin, wintered in Dubbard after massacring many Christians, including one Bishop Morganai of St. David's, who later appeared in a vision to an Irish bishop. Because I ate flesh, I am become flesh, he said. Okay. This Viking force would then depart to Devon, where they were promptly defeated. Some of these Vikings, along with some future ones, probably settled in Wales. Charles Edward states that there may have been commercial colonies in Swansea and the port of Milford Haven, along with some smaller scale inland settlement in Pembrokeshire. However, these were never very large or numerous, and the huge amount of Scandinavian place names in southern Wales is likely a result of these Vikings naming navigational points, rather than being an indicator of large scale settlement. Once the Vikings had departed, Havaith was left with only one foe, the Kingdom of Gwynedd. This land had just gotten a new ruler, Rodri Maur, and he was looking to expand. 
He seems to have wrestled control of Powys away from Mercia sometime in the middle of the 9th century, and at 872 he took advantage of the untimely death of the King of Ceredigion and annexed all of his realm. Although this would make these lands quite contentious between the two kingdoms, Rodri would not live to see a war break out. The King of Gwynedd was killed six years later by a Mercian army, and his realm would fall to his sons. Both Mound and Charles Edwards suggest that Gwynedd may not have been able to hold onto these lands permanently. The sons of Havaith will soon be recorded attacking lands far to the north of Doved, potentially suggesting that this kingdom successfully reabsorbed its old eastern core and potentially annexed Ceredigion as well. For now, I'm going to meet these theories in the middle and show Doved regaining Ustred Toei but Gwynedd continuing to hold Ceredigion. To support this, the Historia Bretonum was written in Gwynedd around this time, and it contains a passage detailing the first King of Gwynedd's expulsion of the Irish from Gwynedd and Ceredigion, seeming to cement Rodri Mawr's claim over this region, which notably did not include Doved or Ustrad Toei. Despite Rodri's death, Gwynedd was still extremely powerful, and Rodri's sons were just as expansionist as their father. They avenged his death at the Battle of Conwy in 881, where the annals record that God himself took revenge upon the Mercians. With Mercian power firmly broken in Wales, there was now a vacuum to be filled. The sons of Rodri Mawr sought to secure this position over the kingdoms to the south, namely Doved and Brecheniog, and their apparently highly aggressive strategies caused Havaith of Doved and Elise of Brecheniog to seek assistance from a powerful neighbour, the Kingdom of Wessex. Alfred the Great, the King of Wessex, had a connection to Dovid in his court, in the form of the Welsh monk Asser, who was originally from St David's, and who wrote Alfred's biography in 893. So Asser left for Wessex, and he soon joined the court of Alfred the Great. By this time, around 893, the kingdoms of Gwent and Glowasing had already received Alfred's patronage, and now the kingdoms of Dovid and Brycheiniog would seek the same protection by Alfred from the sons of Rodri Mawr. Alfred's list of Welsh kingdoms noticeably leaves out Powys and Ceredigion, most likely indicating that they had both been annexed by Rodri Mawr, although again some historians disagree on how permanent these conquests may have been. Havaith died in 893, likely very soon after the writing of the life of King Alfred by Asser, and his kingdom would pass to his son, Llywarch. His reign would not be an easy one, and only about one or two years following the death of his father, the armies of Gwynedd would march into Ustrad Toei. It is here that we come to the evidence of the potential reconquest of the Toei Valley by Doved, since, if this valley was in the possession of Gwynedd, why would they invade it? In the past, it has been suggested that the two remaining sons of Rodri Mawr, Andaraud and Kadesh, had split the kingdom between themselves and had come to blows through sheer familial rivalry. However, some historians such as Carrie Mound prefer to suggest that Dovet had simply begun to dispute these lands with Gwynedd, but others such as Charles Edwards prefer to interpret the evidence that we have seen so far as Dovet having conquered both of these lands. The most interesting factor of this invasion, however, is the fact that Gwynedd had support from an English army, the Anglis. Mound suggests that perhaps Havai's successor had not renewed his vassalage to Alfred, or that Alfred had instead chosen to side with the more powerful kingdom of Gwynedd. However, as Charles Edwards points out, Alfred had previously sought to defend Dovid from Gwynedd, and the use of Angli in the Annals is different to the typical Saxons used to refer to the English in general. It is possible that the Annals are referring to Mercia, who may have been seeking to regain their overlordship over Wales. You see, at this time, Wessex was in a bit of trouble with some people from Denmark, which may have posed a good opportunity for Gwynedd and Mercia, two countries that had previously been restrained by Wessex, to once again expand. If this was the case, then the exact relationship between these two kingdoms is not known. Mercia may have ensured, or simply wished to have, the vassalage of Gwynedd, but in any case, these two may have just simply formed an alliance, and the Kingdom of Dovid, under the protection from a very preoccupied Wessex, seems to have suffered the most from it. Alfred the Great died in 899, and while his successor, Edward the Elder, maintained a nominal overlordship over Dovid, Brycheiniog, Gwent, and Glowasing, he couldn't really act on it. Not only were the Danes occupying eastern England, but Edward's cousin Athelwald also began to dispute the throne. Llawach ap Havaid, king of Dovid, died by unknown means in 903, giving Gwynedd one final opportunity to complete its conquest of western Wales. Llawach had no sons, only a daughter, Ellen, who will become important later. So he was succeeded by his brother, Rodri, who reigned for an incredible one year before dying in Arwisli, a region of Powys. The Annals Cambria tell us that he was beheaded, which coupled with the fact that he died in enemy territory suggests that he was defeated in battle by Gwynedd and then executed. 
The final annexation of David may not have occurred for another two years, however, as a battle and an attack on St. David's are both recorded in 906, possibly marking the end of the Kingdom of David. Kadesh, the second son of Rodri Mauer, likely controlled these lands to the south, and in around 909, the Chronicum Scotorum would name him King of the Britons on his deathbed, along with his brother Anaraud seven years later, very likely indicating that Kadesh controlled a substantial area, most likely the southwest by the time of his death. So by the year 910, the Kingdom of David, forged from a Roman civitas and governed by men from across the Irish Sea, would be extinguished. Following the death of four monarchs in only 18 years, the lineage of David continued through the daughter of King Owain, and although these monarchs fought for their independence and potentially won much of their territory back, external factors forced their protectors to abandon them, allowing a powerful kingdom of Gwynedd to completely overwhelm them. Cadas ap Rhodri, the son of the man who conquered half of Wales, would reign as king in Pembrokeshire, and on his deathbed his lands would pass to his son, Howaldar a warlord, a lawmaker, and the husband of Ellen, the daughter of one of the last kings of David. Hoa's marriage to Ellen likely only secured legitimacy. The kingdom of David had already been conquered after a sustained two-decade campaign no less, and the ascension of a marital link to the old kingdom likely just, as Charles Edward puts it, smoothed over a political hiatus. Unlike many marriages in the pedigrees of the Kings of Wales, we actually have evidence that this one existed, rather than being a potentially fabricated link, which were a very common occurrence. Rodri Mauer, the conqueror of Ceredigion and Powys, claimed to have familial ties with both kingdoms. However, neither of these links can be proven. Gwyneth would also attach Ceredigion to their founding myth, by claiming a son of their first king founded the kingdom here. With David, however, no such connection was made. Howell, or his son Owain, are likely the men who created the Halean genealogies, and they place themselves directly into the line of David. Rather than claiming descent from Gwynedd through Cadas and Rodri Mauer, they claim descent from the kings of David via Ellen, the daughter of Sawarch. Although, like I said towards the start of this video, they disagree with the ancestry of Trifin, the first named king of David. Historians favour the Daishi origin, for reasons that will become clear in a moment, but Howell, like many of the kings of Wales, favoured a Roman connection, which provided legitimacy and, as Mount puts it, an ancient right to rule. Trifon was said to have descended from an eclectic bunch of people, including the King of Brycheiniog, Roman Emperor Magnus Maximus, Roman Emperor Constantine, Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, the Demeter, as in a guy called Demeter, Protectoris, a Roman title that I mentioned earlier, Stator, apparently a Roman magistrate's marshal, and finally, a man named Cupbearer and Mixer. One name, Cupbearer and Mixer. According to Holdar, Constantine's son, Magnus Maximus's great-great-great-grandfather, was a man named Cupbearer and Mixer. What a collection. Most of these aren't even names. I don't think these emperors were direct blood relatives. And also, this king is from Brycheiniog. That's not even the right kingdom. Following the conquest of Dovid and the death of Cadas ap Rodri, Huldar would hold this kingdom along with Ceredigion as one unit, known as the Kingdom of the Habarth. The ancient Irish dynasty would no longer rule but the future kings of this country could still claim descent from the very first Daishi who migrated across the Irish Sea, even if they didn't want to acknowledge it. David at this time would be a host to history and learning. Not only were the Harlean genealogies composed here, but a large portion of the Annals Cambria may have originated in St. David's too. The devastating raids of the Mercians may have stopped for now, but their long-term impact was obvious, as the prophetic poem Armes Prydain Vaur, which foretold of a Welsh victory that would drive the Saxons out of Britain, was probably composed in Dovid around this time, and I'm sure it was very scary. This prophecy would become very slightly correct, as soon the Saxons, who by this time had been slowly attempting to conquer Wales for about the past 300 years, would no longer be the masters of Britain. This change, however, would not come from a Brythonic rebellion or from a source of divine wrath, but instead from across the English Channel, where a new threat was brewing. In a little over a century, the organisation, language and landscape of England would begin to change dramatically, and these new kings of England would be much more keen on a Welsh conquest. But for now, David had been conquered. Hoaldar was a king of a brand new kingdom, and he had his eyes set on his neighbours to the north and to the east. Join me next time for a brief history of the Kingdom of Dehabarth, and thank you very much for watching.